Hi, this is The Philosophical Angle, and I'm your host, Chris Angle. I'm the author of four books on philosophy, one of which is The Nature of Aesthetics. With me are uh, my co-hosts and panelists, um, Professor Mark Brennan. There's Mark here on the left. And over on the right, we've got uh, Remy Canario, a political analyst. Uh, and uh, on the phone with us, uh, although his picture we can't be seen, is Rick Samuelson, a venture capitalist on the West Coast. Guys, welcome. Okay, uh, the, the purpose of the philosophical angle is to discuss the concepts in current media. <clears throat> and this week, our subject is, and let's pull that up, is the construction of an equitable agreement uh, between Iran, the United States, and possibly the rest of the world, <clears throat> with all the side agreements that seem to be coming about. So we're going to, uh, I'm going to open up the conversation with a little uh, introduction uh, with this uh, about what's happening. And obviously there's an agreement in the, uh, uh, in the offing, and with it is a uh, discussion of a of a, of a peace agreement. And what is peace? So let's, uh, let's define peace, first of all. Peace is the fulfillment of one's rewards uh, without outside intervention. Uh, so, uh, and uh, and that, that is within a context of freedom. And freedom is the initiations of one's priorities uh, to obtain uh, one's rewards. And when I say priorities, priorities are a piece of knowledge that, uh, that we use and that we construct in our daily lives uh, based on our sacrifices that we, that we make in order to get certain uh, objectives and rewards. And, and when, we've, when we make these objectives and rewards, we note how important they are to us, and that's what I call a priority. And the... Uh, uh, so, in order to do this, we, we, need, we need to have peace and, and freedom in an absence of, uh, of conflict, and that's why we, we construct these agreements, and, uh, uh, for example, the one with Iran on a, on a global basis. Uh, inside uh, 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 a priority here the, uh, is, uh, is a risk, is a, is a sacrifice. When we make a sacrifice, uh, uh, we, uh, all of life uh, makes its decisions to do sacrifices uh, and uh, to produce rewards. And within that uh, sacrifice is our, our risk in doing so, our information and knowledge uh, in doing so, the, uh, uh, the time and effort that it takes to do so, and, and if, it, uh, it's, uh, if material may be involved also, so our possessions may be involved in making our decision. And so when we uh, when we make a decision, uh, we often have to use a uh, a, a, a reward ratio. The reward of uh, we have to uh, we have to understand how much risk, how much information, how much time does it take, how much effort does it take to make a decision, and these uh, these factors of risk and information and knowledge and time and effort um, uh, as they uh, as they decrease. And, uh, and should the rewards increase, the incentive to do so becomes stronger to, uh, to initiate uh, this little equation that, uh, that I'm putting forth here of, of your risk and your time and your information and your effort equaling uh, the reward. Uh, and an example uh, of, uh, of this, should the uh, reward or time or effort to obtain a, uh, a desideratum should become smaller, the chances of an individual initiating a decision to obtain a certain reward increases. And so we're going to summarize here life's decisional statement, uh, as I understand it, uh, using these. Uh, so on one side, you're going to have uh, your, uh, your sacrifice uh, and those ingredients of the sacrifice, which we've just talked about. And, and uh, this uh, comes up with a reward for for one side, and then the other side, you're gonna. So if you if you go out down to uh, Walmart and you make a transaction, on the other side of the of the counter for your when you uh, when you buy something, uh, you're sacrificing your money uh, to uh, obtain a reward, such as like a tube of toothpaste or something that you're buying at Walmart or some other place. Uh, 
So the other person has sacrificed his time and effort and uh, etc. And that's his production, uh, uh, his sacrifice to produce something. Uh, and he swaps that uh, with uh, uh, with uh, what you've got to sacrifice. Okay. So and uh, so our application to the what, why we're talking about this in the application to the Iran agreement is that is that this also uh, on a grander scale is the same is the same transaction that will happen um, uh, for the between the U.S. and Iran. Each country wants something. So uh, the U.S. rewards are a delay of progress in making nuclear missiles. Um, Iran's rewards will be lifting the, the restrictions, lifting banking sanctions, oil sales, exporting products. It'll be quite a, it's quite obvious that uh, this agreement will be uh, uh, advantageous to uh, Iran. Um, and the U.S. In incentive is the uh, is that perhaps the world will become safer. Um, and uh, so let's go to our third page of our document and discuss the incentive and uh, rewards of, uh, of this agreement that's, uh, that's coming forth, that's going to be voted upon. The, uh, the U.S. incentives to initiate the, uh, uh, the, the sacrifice uh, uh, versus the reward ratio of, our, of, of a decision-making process. The sacrifice is uh, our information, our, our, our risk and, and time and, 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 and reward to, uh, to get a, a safer world. And, and the risk here is, uh, is low. Now, we have, we're going to discuss later um, what kind of reward that is for us. Uh, I don't think it's much of a reward because I don't think the safety aspect is really coming into the agreement, but we'll discuss that in a little bit. Uh, on the Iranian side, the incentives to initiate uh, the sacrifice um, seems to be uh, the risk there is, is low. But the reward is quite a bit. An advancement in their nuclear program. Um, they can uh, take uh, more time to accumulate knowledge uh, to develop their nuclear program. And uh, so uh, the reward, I, I feel, is great. The sacrifice of their effort is uh, in, in putting forth this and uh, joining this agreement is, is, is little. Uh, yet uh, uh, the reward, is, as I just mentioned, is great. Uh, there's no sacrifice on the Iranian side of material. In other words, they can keep everything. And, uh, uh, and they get uh, to keep their banking assets that were frozen. Uh, their oil now can be, uh, will be available on the world market. Uh, and uh, so uh, this is probably a, 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 a very good uh, deal for the Iranians to make. Uh, lastly, and uh, um, how do we uh, uh, stop the nuclear proliferation and, and make the agreement stronger? Well, um, if you uh, don't want to risk reward or risk a, a war uh, with Iran, um, then um, you would take out any military threat. And so that's what I think Obama has done, is that he's not put in any uh, uh, military uh, intervention threat. And so the Iranians on the other side, not seeing any risk uh, that they have uh, in, in not making the agreement, uh, are able to establish uh, uh, be able to receive quite a bit in establishing this agreement. Um, but um, so if the risk were to grow, then I think the agreement would become more equitable. 
if you bring up the, uh, the threat level to make the risk high for Iran, then I think we can see that the, uh, uh, that the Iranians uh, would give us more and better incentive uh, to give us verification, uh, which has really not been produced uh, so far. So the U.S. did not present an element of risk to Iran during the uh, bargaining process. Thus, the reward uh, coming to the U.S. will be commensurately small. Uh, and thus, I'd like to conclude with bringing up an old Roman adage uh, uh, and that I think that when in dealing with other nations um, and, uh, and, and putting out bargaining agreements, it says that he who wants peace, get ready for war. And so I'd like to see what you guys think about that, whether uh, that agreement uh, has any bearing on producing a, an equitable agreement with, uh, with Iran. And so, um, and whether this, uh, whether this agreement is equitable in its, uh, in its uh, entirety as, as the Senate and, uh, is gonna take a look at it. And uh, was it worth uh, manufacturing? And it, by the way, is it a treaty or is it an agreement? Guys, I turn it over to you. Well, it's not a treaty because it wasn't ratified by the Senate, so we can dispense with that pretty quickly. That's right. It's pretty clearly the case. Yeah, that's right. So uh, in the Constitution, it says that uh, two-thirds of, uh, of uh, approval must come from uh, the Senate in order to ratify a treaty. So uh, they're not- Chris, remember, remember, remember my favorite theory. Uh, the Constitution poses no threat to our current form of government. So let's not get, let's not get caught up on nitpicking <laughs> with the Constitution. <laughs> well, it, we, we, we should draw uh, some relevance uh, from it uh, because- Yeah, we're, we're, we're sticks in the mud, but you know, the way the world works is not you know, according to the Constitution. Uh, no, well, sorry. <laughs> right. Well, Remy, let me ask you, what do you think about this agreement? I think that um, it's very easy to look at the agreement and to see what you want to see. I mean, certainly people on the more international side of things think uh, that this is a tremendous achievement, far greater uh, than uh, a deal than we could have ever hoped for. Obviously, people on the other side see it as full of holes and um, uh, 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 providing any number of opportunities for Iranians to cheat. Um, but at the end of the day, I believe that we ultimately have to look at what the alternatives were and uh, judge the, uh, the success or failure of, of the agreement based off of um, its, how it relates to the alternatives. And quite frankly, I, I, I do not think that the, uh, the United States um, was going to go to war with Iran um, simply because the, uh, the I agree. people of this not want that. Um, so uh, to try to include that in the bargaining would have been bluffing in a, in a very obvious way and thus um, uh, probably counterproductive. So uh, uh, altogether, I'm actually um, pleasantly surprised, although of course still apprehensive uh, by this outcome. Well, I'm not so sure that I, I think that uh, the, the United States has been in the Middle East before on a, on a basis of uh, uh, presenting armed troops there and uh, and we're actually there right now and I guess we're going to initiate some uh, further military action so I I don't think we'd be truly uh, completely bluffing uh, we've been there and shown that we've been in Afghanistan and in Iraq and uh, and I think that uh, a, a bluff is uh, is is really not the right terminology here what do you think we are absolutely everywhere. And when you're absolutely everywhere, you're in effect nowhere. So we're not really there. We are truly in every single country in the world. Well, I'm not sure I understand that statement. Because we have been in Iraq and because we have been in Afghanistan, that's the precise reason why I don't think we would ever go into Iran. We have seen this play out before, and the United States public is tired of it, and we also can't afford it. Um, and not only that, Iran is a far larger and more sophisticated country than Iraq ever was. Uh, an invasion of Iran simply is not in the cards. Um, certainly not for the next 
Not, not off these two who, 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 who said anything about invading Iran? Can I, can I pile on? Let me pile on there. Right. Uh, most importantly, and I only look at this from the American perspective because I happen to be American and I only care about the United States. Most importantly, Iran poses no threat to the United States. The United States is comprised of 50 states, and there are two that are not on the continent of the United States, Alaska and Hawaii. So we should not really concern ourselves with the fears of Saudi Arabia and Egypt and Israel. That's their problem. The other thing is, Iran, as we speak right now, is fighting ISIS and Al-Qaeda. And all the people who are so against this treaty have conveniently forgotten that Al-Qaeda has the blood of 3,000 Americans on its hands. Right. Now, it's not always the case that the enemy of my enemy is my friend. But remember, in World War II, we had a convenient agreement with Stalin, who was more disgusting than the Iranian regime squared. So I've got no problem with leaving alone a country that poses no threat to us, that has not started a war in over 400 years, and that we did our best job to empower by taking down its lifelong enemy in Iraq. So. When we talk about this, we are for Americans. We ought to talk about it in the American national interest, not in what's good for certain lobbies that have are holding our government by the short hairs. Uh, Rick, are you with us? I'm here. Rick, you want to uh, you want to chime in because we uh, we almost forgot about you because we're not we don't see you. <laughs> uh, well, I think this treaty proposed agreement rather needs to be viewed in the context of a pattern of appeasement that has guided the Obama administration you know, for years now. Uh, it is not a policy that has succeeded uh, when measured in these terms. There are now millions of refugees uh, around the Middle East as a result of an ever-growing sphere of conflict. Uh, in some cases, open war, in other cases, terrorism, uh, in other cases, uh, deprivation of uh, goods and services in particular areas, people getting their heads cut off. What's going on in the Middle East today is reminiscent of medieval practices, nothing like anything we've seen in, you know, certainly the last 50 years. Uh, so that's the context, and this proposed agreement is another attempt at addressing that larger problem with a solution uh, that hasn't worked so far and certainly won't work in the future. In other words, it will have no impact whatsoever on diminishing the Middle East conflict, none at all. In fact, what will happen is the United States is effectively approving, all right, implicitly approving, the continued expansion in the scope of this conflict. So now the moral uh, approval of the United States has been freely given for a series of horrors that are only going to grow over the next several years. Okay, well, the, the proposed agreement is morally offensive and won't accomplish what it seeks out to do. Because the issue at hand is not the issue of whether uh, Iran gets a nuclear arms. It will. That's, that's, that's a foregone conclusion. If the question is how do you contain Iran? Because they continue to be the largest regional supporter of terrorist activity. They must be contained. We can successfully contain the Soviet Union. We can contain Iran. So the sanctions should continue, the agreement should be dropped, and we should continue on our prior course. Okay, I, I, uh, that's a, you bring up a real good point because you've, uh, you've, you've brought up your, uh, what Mark has uh, uh, brought up also. Is it within the United States' interest to uh, get a well-constructed agreement? So uh, you've, you've ma made some good points as to why we should. Now, Remy, I saw you wanted to uh, say something. Go ahead. I think that um, it is very important for us not to conflate issues here. Uh, the Middle East is in a, a state of unbelievable turmoil. I would argue that it is uh, a bit myopic to, uh, to 
put all of that on Obama's doorstep. They are uh, countries with their own issues, their own histories, and they also had a little bit of a role to play in the, in the state of affairs that we currently are seeing. That said, the issue of nuclear proliferation stands on its own. Nuclear weapons have an impact um, that is worth a fighting of, 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 that is so disproportionate um, with any other form of weaponry that it is worth fighting um, uh, in parallel to anything else that we want to talk about in the region. And so, uh, indeed, it, it would be a moral failure to allow a state that does have a history of, uh, of supporting terrorism to acquire nuclear weapons, and so uh, this should stand on its own. Well, this, what is this? Uh, you said this should stand on its own. Under that theory, we probably need to invade Pakistan tomorrow. Pakistan has supported terrorism all over the place. Talk to anybody in India. Pakistan has nukes. Why don't we invade them? Because they have nukes. North Korea is run by an absolute insane madman. Are you bothering him? No. There happen to be 35,000 Americans a stone's throw away from the North Korean nukes. We need to remove them from South Korea. The South Koreans can defend themselves. On average, South Koreans are six inches taller than North Koreans because of better nutrition. So we need to stop that. The problems in the Middle East are the problems in the Middle East. It's more of a problem for Europe because it's closer. It has no effect on the United States. All we care about, the only national interest the United States has is the free flow of oil from that region. The only thing Jimmy Carter got right in his entire idiotic four-year tenure was when he said the national interest is not necessarily the sum of the special interests. And that's what's driving our policy right now, is special interests who care more about their ethnic and religious ties to that region than they care about the United States. They're anti-patriotic. Okay, Mark has made up the point here, as I, as I understand it, that our, really our only interest in the Far East is the production of oil. Uh, is, is that, uh, what do you think, guys? I would say fighting terrorism is also a strong interest, and so uh, maintaining a relationship that will allow us to do that effectively. Um, it also has to be a priority, and sometimes that means um, uh, holding your nose when dealing with certain unsavory characters, such as Saudi Arabia, who are um, nevertheless extremely useful. Rick, you had something? Well, the United States is bound by a whole network of treaties, and those treaties That's right. either have to be honored or we're in the breach. And if we're not going to honor those treaties, uh, for example, our treaty with the Ukraine, whereby we agreed, and I talked to Ukraine about this about a month ago, that in the event of a Russian invasion, because they gave up their nuclear weapons, we would intervene and protect them. We breached that treaty under Mr. Obama. That's right. Okay? That kind of precedent uh, makes the, the whole world trust the United States less. That's right. So in, in my view, if you're going to enter a treaty, you abide by that treaty and you don't breach it. And we can't, unless we're going to uh, somehow renegotiate those treaties, we have to abide by the treaties we've agreed to up to now. I agree. That's, that's, that's great theory, but history tells us treaties only last until one of the parties decides, you know what, this treaty is not doing any good, and they abrogate it. So uh, treaties are great in theory, they don't work in practice. I take strong issue with the, with the idea that the world trusts the United States less as a result of less American military adventurism. I mean, if you look at, the, uh, at America's approval ratings around the world, uh, they have uh, gone up substantially since Iraq and substantially since uh, Afghanistan, ever since Obama took uh, the presidency, and that is in large part because we are no longer acting like cowboys. Uh, Remy, you just used the word uh, phrase, military adventurism, and, uh, and mixed it with uh, we acting like cowboys. Can you elaborate on that? I don't understand why you would say such a thing. Well, because we're talking about Ukraine, where the uh, one of the two players is Russia, uh, which is a nuclear armed state. Uh, now, a military intervention by the United States into Ukraine has the potential to set off World War III. It's also not our issue. This is a purely European issue. The whole civil war started as a result of a treaty that was to be signed with the EU. They are the ones who have the leverage over Russia in the form of, of, of a substantial amount of trade. Um, we have no substantial trade with Russia, and therefore sanction, our sanctions are basically meaningless. Um, for us to get involved in that conflict would be nothing short of egocentric military adventurism. It really would be. Oh, uh, Chris, point of clarification. Yeah. Russia is actually a failing 
nuclear state, even better, even even more reason to, to not uh, cross their path. And the real reason the United States hates uh, Russia right now is because uh, Vladimir Putin, uh, as a social conservative, stands against everything the American people, and especially this regime, promotes. So whereas he believes in the sanctity of uh, marriage as between a man and a woman, that flies completely in the face of the, Amer the current American ethos as adopted about 15 minutes ago. So everything Putin is, 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 is pushing has been uh, flushed down the toilet as, as, as the United States continues its mad rush to do away with every best, last vestige of Western civilization. <laughs> That's quite a statement there, uh, Mark. Uh... And, and, and by the way, Remy was dead on. Uh, the Ukraine, and I'll, I will call it the Ukraine, the Ukraine is in Russia's near abroad. It has no effect on us. We promised, we swore up and down when we were trying to get France and England to, to, to allow Germany to reunite, we swore up and down that the eastern border of NATO would not expand one inch uh, as to, so as to threaten the Soviet Union. Instead, what do we do? We bring in the Baltics, we bring in all these eastern provinces of the, of, of behind, behind the Iron Curtain, and we can completely piss off and threaten the Russians. When, by the way, they should be our natural allies. It's a Christian country uh, beset with Muslim terrorism and rife with natural resources that we could help them exploit and use. But of course, that flies in the face of, of our current perverted regime, uh, and, and as I said before, the current American ethos. But it's Russia's near abroad. It's your problem, as Remy said. It's not our problem. We have to stop. In, we have to stop. You know, we've been cowboys. We have to stop doing a national imitation of John McCain and exalting that kind of stupidity. Okay, uh, Rick, uh, uh, you want to? Did you want to offer a rejoinder to? No international order without observing treaty and. Uh, if you don't, you can't. If you if you can't possibly have a sustainable peace anywhere in the world. So that's uh, right. I completely reject that proposition. Uh, yeah, that's just, that's, that's tautological. He's, speak, he's speaking purely tautologically. The treaty works. Everybody says, "Wow, look, the treaty works. This is how we keep peace." And then one one country decides, "Oh, I don't want to be part of this treaty anymore," so they abrogate it. And by definition, we don't have peace. That's how that, that's just the, the solution can't possibly be to discard the notion of having treaties. How else do you uh, set up a structure for um, setting boundaries, for setting limits on uh, uh, influence? There's no other way to do it. Yeah, Rick, Rick, I, I, they're good. I'm just saying they're not perfect and they're not panaceas. Are they worth having at all, Mark? We should, we should look at them cynically. Mark, are they worth having at all? Sure, they're worth entering into, and for as long as they last, they're great. But you know, talk to Stalin when, when, when you know when the Nazi-Soviet anti-aggression pact was broken. Uh, oh, there was a treaty they signed. What happened? Why did the Nazis invade the Soviet Union? Oh, we had a treaty going. Oops, no more treaty. Just to elaborate on that point a little bit, I would say that there, the, this current system where we have treaties with the expectation that they may, may be broken constitutes the current system, and I'd say that it's, that it works probably better than anything else would. Okay. When cities are broken, containment can be exerted. Go ahead, Rick. Say that again. I didn't. I didn't catch that. Well, in the instance where treaties are broken, then one has the moral authority to react, and that's where policies like containment work very, very well. And I see no reason why we should be lifting any of the sanctions on Iran when it is demonstrable that they're continuing to or terrorism across the whole Middle Eastern region. It's, Agreed. It's absurd. And, all right, so let, guys, 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 one second, one second. We need to get back to the original question here of the uh, of allowing Iran to go forward with their military, to use Remy's face, their military nuclear uh, adventurism. So should this be allowed? Final, final answer for all of you, because we're running out of time. Go ahead, uh, Mark first. First of all, you, you, you misstated what Remy said. Remy said the United States was adventurism, not not Iran. I see. Yeah, to use his phrase, that's right. Go ahead, Remy. I would say that history is very clear. Uh, countries acquire nuclear weapons for one reason, and that is a perceived existential threat. The reason that North Korea has nuclear weapons today is. Uh, widely believed to be a combination of Bush's axis of evil speech and the Iraq war. Now we have a nuclear armed Korea that's because they believe that there was an existential threat that the, the regime would be taken down. 
the last thing that we want to do is to give Iran an existential threat um, to, in order to motivate their nuclear program. Rick? I believe a policy of containment should continue, that if Iran is given access to the $100 billion that has frozen in uh, various foreign bank accounts, it will use some portion of that money to increase its level of terrorist activity. I don't think it's a reform regime whatsoever, and I don't think they will actually use a nuclear weapon uh, in the context of the region being pretty well armed including Israel. So I think the, the, the mutually assured destruction is enough of a disincentive that Iran is more part than fight. Okay, guys, I want to thank you very much. Our, uh, our, uh, we've kind of run out of time here. So uh, next week, we'll see you all again. And uh, thank you for joining us on The Philosophical Angle. Thank you. Thank you.